So I'm so excited today to be able to spend some time with Colonel Steve Warren. He is the spokesman for Operation Inherent Resolve, and he is coming to from Baghdad, right? I'm in Baghdad right now. Yeah, it's uh, it's uh, 4 p.m. 4 p.m. I was just about to ask you how late it was because I was thinking it was much later, but I'm so thankful and humbled that you would take some time of your part of your day to just sit down with us and talk to us a little bit about what's going on in Iraq and how we as military families can support what you guys are doing over there. And um, really what I'd love to do today is talk about what is Operation Inherent Resolve, um, what, what are our troops going um, through over there, and how military families back here can support them better, how military spouses can educate themselves better on what's going on. And one of the ways you do that so well with educating and you have such a teaching spirit. Um, so let me tell everybody a little bit about how I met you. Uh, when I traveled okay. with the Secretary of Defense in December, I got a chance to watch you work with the press that was putting out these daily files, these daily articles on um, our efforts in Iraq and with the coalition forces. And for me, it was a massive wake-up call to just, number one, watch the process of how news is made. That's something that we as military families, and I think Americans in general, don't usually get to see. And so yeah. to watch you educate them and answer their questions and help them understand the complexities of military strategy and everything that's happening over there was awesome to watch. And more than anything, it was a huge wake-up call for me to realize how little I understood about what was happening in Iraq, where we were in Iraq, and um, what our troops really need. And so your teaching spirit was awesome to watch. You're excellent at your job. And um, I've since been able to follow you on Twitter and see how you're also trying to educate all of us to understand better what's going so going on over there. So thank you so much for joining me today. And we have lots to talk about. So thanks for being here. Well, we do have a lot to talk about, and I am humbled to be here. Believe me, this is uh, what the things that you do, Corey, are so important uh, to our, uh, our our entire community. No matter what service—Army, Navy, Air Force, Marine Corps, even the Coast Guard—you know, we're we're both, uh, you know, Army people. Uh, but what you're doing is touching everyone, and, and people are watching. And so I'm so proud. Uh, to be part of this, to even be able to contribute a little bit. So uh, it really is my pleasure. So thank you. Yeah, this is awesome. And thanks for giving me the opportunity to kind of reach across the ocean here and, and talk to you. And I'm Baghdad. It's awesome. And to say that I've been there is even cooler to me. So, okay. So what would you say, kind of explain to everybody a little bit about what Operation Inherent Resolve is. I know as an army spouse who is connected with, you know, my service member went to Afghanistan a couple times. And so all mm -hmm. we've heard, some of us, is Operation Enduring Freedom. And so tell us a little bit about what Operation Inherent Resolve is and what we're trying to do over there. Well, Operation Inherent Resolve, maybe I'll, I'll start with a little bit of a, of a history lesson. That's great. Uh, that's okay with you. So Operation Inherent Resolve, we call it, of course, OIR, uh, is an operation that we've been conducting now for uh, almost two years, a year, about about 20 months, so just, sh just short of two years. Uh, and it began when this terrorist group uh, that grew up in Syria uh, as kind of a result of the this terrible civil war that's been going on in Syria really for almost five years. So you have this terrible internal civil war uh, that's been kind of brewing or or worse, it's been active combat now for, for about five years. Um, and it's really fractured uh, Syrian society. Um, and one of the things that grew out of that war is this outfit um, called ISIL, um, the Islamic State um, of Iraq and the Levant, ISIL. And so this outfit is, a, I mean, it's a straight up old fashioned terrorist group, uh, but with a twist. Uh, a lot of terrorist groups, uh, you know, are mostly simply interested in creating terror uh, and, and causing problems to other countries. This group has decided that they want to create their own country. Uh, they call it the word they use is caliphate, which is, is, is kind of an old religious word in, in the Muslim Islam uh, to, to mean, you know, uh, an Islamic state, uh, essentially. And so they... Uh, kind of grew up. They started out as part of, of Al-Qaeda, and of course we're all familiar with Al-Qaeda. They gained in strength, gained in strength, 
they broke from Al Qaeda uh, because they wanted to establish their state right now. Uh, Al Qaeda wants to just do terrorism for a while. Uh, so they had a split. Uh, and then this group rapidly became very powerful. They're very attractive uh, to a lot of the kind of the, the young, um, unemployed uh, uh, people in Syria uh, and then around the world. So they grew up, they grew rapidly, they became stronger, they captured a lot of weapons, and then they decided, okay, we're going to declare this caliphate. And they started attacking, and they started rampaging their way through Syria, uh, and they captured a large swath of eastern Syria. The oil fields, they declared their capital to be this town in Syria, the city called Raqqa. Uh, and then they gained a little more strength, and then they attacked Iraq. And when they came into Iraq, it was very suddenly, and it was very powerfully. And they came across the border uh, in the north. They captured Sinjar, which is a, a place people have heard of in the news a little bit. It's, it's an area that has this minority called the Yazidis. They captured Sinjar. They moved north into Mosul, and then they followed the Tigris River south through Mosul, through a lot of the Kurdish lands, and kept gobbling up territory on their way to Baghdad. Simultaneously, they had another prong of their attack that went through the Euphrates River Valley, and it started in al Qaim, which few people have heard of, but then it moved into towns and cities that a lot of us have heard of, uh, like Hit, Ramadi, Fallujah, and, and, and so those two kind of axes of advance uh, started to converge on Baghdad, and there was a while there when it looked like they really might could get to Baghdad. Um, and so it became a real problem for us. So eventually the world, and, and then during all of this, of course, is when they were doing all these horrible atrocities, beheadings and burning people and, and drowning and just all these awful things. Uh, so the world kind of got together and said, you know, this can't stand. We can't allow Baghdad to fall. Uh, so we've got to do something. So this coalition came together of nations, uh, European nations, obviously led by the United States of America and a bunch of other countries joined in. And we began to help the Iraqis stop ISIL. Now, the Iraqi army, they honestly, they kind of just collapsed. And it was heartbreaking to see. You know, this is the Iraqi army that we had trained for so long. Uh, for so many years, we'd been here and, and worked with them. Um, for whatever reason, and we could get into the reasons, I suppose, they just, they collapsed. Uh, and they didn't fight. And so that's what allowed the, this, this terrorist group to make so much progress. And so we started out by first, uh, sending some uh, security forces to protect the embassy. Uh, and then we sent some special forces to help uh, build the Iraqi army back, help just kind of collect them up because they were in complete disarray. And then, of course, we began airstrikes. And these airstrikes really are what kind of blunted uh, ISIL's momentum uh, and stopped them. And so we kind of held them off with airstrikes for a while. Uh, we helped the Iraqi army get themselves you know, recombobulated, they'd become a little discombobulated. And so we kind of helped the Iraqis piece themselves back together. And then we decided to, to really help them on the offensive part of the operation, right? They need, now they need to take their country back. Mm -hmm. uh, so we sent some more advisors here. We sent some trainers here. Uh, we've, we've committed some money. Uh, and we're now in the process of rebuilding uh, this army that shattered back in 2014. Uh, and we're getting them back on their feet. And, and so they're fighting back now. Uh, they've taken back almost 45% of the territory that they had lost uh, originally. Uh, and they're slowly but surely making progress. And so our role now is, is kind of a couple of areas. You know, number one, of course, are these airstrikes. That's what people hear most about. Uh, and these airstrikes are really focused on, on, on two things, well, two or three things. One, just striking these enemy forces in the field. Number two, striking their leaders to try and take out their, their, their leaders. And then number three, striking what I call their industrial base, right? Their industrial base is, you know, their VBID, their, their truck bomb factories, uh, their weapons factories. Uh, they make money through oil. They, they, they captured some oil fields and they pump the oil and sell it on the black market. So we hit those. Um, so that's thing one that we do, airstrikes. Number two uh, is training. We've set up these training centers now in Iraq in three or four different places where we just, it's almost like boot camp. It's good old fashioned basic training. Bring the Iraqis in uh, and we just send them through, through basic training and teach them you know, how to fight. 
so that, that's number two, and that's a very involved process. Several thousand people here are doing that. Uh, and then I think, the, I guess the last thing is this advise and assist. What that is, is it's generally more senior folks, um, E8s, E9s, uh, officers at the, you know, kind of the 03, 04, and 05 level who go to the Iraqi headquarters and, and help the Iraqi uh, military organize themselves, help them figure out how to make plans, help them figure out how to integrate uh, the air power that we're delivering with their own ground maneuver. So that's in a nutshell, you know, what we've been doing here for the last couple of years. Uh, and that's what we're going to keep doing. Our, our, we we kind of believe that the city of Mosul, you might have heard of that in the news once or twice. Uh, Mosul uh, is, is the second largest city in Iraq. And it's the city that uh, the enemy has said is the capital of their caliphate in Iraq. So we think that if we can capture Mosul or liberate Mosul, uh, that'll be really the beginning of the end for these guys. Uh, so that's kind of what we're focused on. Right now, today, we're fighting for Fallujah. And again, when I say we, there's no American service members actually in there slinging lead, uh, not like before when we were in Fallujah. Uh, certainly, we have American pilots overhead uh, conducting strikes, and we have Americans uh, you know, with their headquarters units uh, advising them. But anyway, uh, so there's fighting going on for Fallujah right now, which is a city we've all heard of, and we have a long history with that city. Uh, and it's going okay. Uh, the Iraqis are doing all right. They've got a long way to go still, but I think they'll get there. And then once the Fallujah battle is over, uh, then it's it's on to it's on to Mosul. So um, I really appreciate that. And like I said, you're so great with making things very simple so that we can understand it better. And I I expect especially appreciate that a lot. So. You know, we talk a lot about coalition, and we use that word a lot, and one of the things that stood out to me in December, and, and I hear you using it now, is um, words get used a lot, and they get used um, so much sometimes that I think we can realize that we don't really understand what they mean. So what I hear you saying is really we're playing a huge supportive role in assisting um, the Iraqi forces to do what it is that they need to do for their own country. Is that a good way of describing what it means to be a U.S. coalition and to partner with these other countries to help them do the same? That's exactly what it means. So the coalition is 66 members. Uh, it's it's actually 64 countries plus two organizations. One of the organizations is called the uh, the GCC, the Gulf. Uh, I can't remember what it stands for. The Gulf countries. Uh, and the other one is called the, the European Union. Uh, and so they, they, they were, they're the two organizations. And then it's 64 countries. And so we've all kind of banded together, everyone contributing what they can. Obviously, we are the most powerful, so we do contribute the most. But all of these contributions are about uh, getting the Iraqis in a place where they can fight their own battle. Uh, you know, we don't think that I mean, we could send the 1st Cavalry Division or um, you know, the first Marine division here, and we could probably clean up ISIL in a matter of months. Honestly, we really could. They're not very good. Mm -hmm. uh, um, but we don't want to do, we don't think if we do that, it'll be a win that really sticks. And we kind of learned that a little bit the last time we were in Iraq, right? You know, we can't do it for them. They have, the Iraqis have to do this for themselves. And so what we're trying to do is rather than, you know, give them a fish, we're trying to teach them how to go fishing. Uh, so that way they can get their military up to strength. They can win their own victories uh, and therefore they can have the confidence and, and et cetera to, to go on and, and kind of make things better for themselves. That's that's our philosophy. I think that's a great way to describe that, because I think one of the things that I hear a lot from families is this, you know, so many of the families are are tired from so many deployments and I'm wondering, you know, is there a stopping point? And I think maybe that's a really good explanation as to why it's taking a little bit longer um, than maybe we would want it to. And but, but you're describing a very good reason for it, too. And I appreciate the fact that you said that, you know, sure, we could go in and we could take care of it a little bit quicker, but it's not in the best interest of this country and probably the surrounding countries as well. Yeah, the truth of the matter is, Corey, we don't want to have to come back here again in five years. So we could come here bring all our power here, our M1 tanks and our Bradley fighting vehicles, and, 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 and we could smoke these guys. We really could. They're not that tough. Uh, and then we'd do that, and then we'd pack up our bags and leave. 
and then I'm here to tell you, we'd be back again in five years. I don't want my kid to have to come here. I have fought enough in Iraq. I've been coming to Iraq since 2004. Enough already. Yeah. Uh, so let's let's get this cleaned up now. Let's get this Iraqi army and the Iraqi people up to a point where they can finally start protecting and defending themselves once and for all, and let them do it. Because I don't I don't want to have to come back again in five years. I don't think anyone does. By the way, how many times have you deployed out there? Well, this is my this is my second full time kind of long term deployment. Of course, when I was working for the secretary, we were here, you know, every couple of every couple of months. It seems like. So you don't have like a regular deployment schedule. It's because you were there in December when I saw you in December. So you have a little bit of a different schedule. Well, no, I I, I came here in August, and I've been here ever since uh, on this deployment. So, uh, yeah, this is another year, another year in Iraq. Another year in Iraq. <laughs> One of the things that surprised me when we went to the DFAC in Baghdad together. Um, another sign of just how little I was understanding and how little I knew was I was really surprised to see so many of the coalition troops that were in the DFAC. And I remember asking you, there were so many uniforms that I didn't recognize. And so when you tell me that there's 64 countries that are helping with this, that floors me because I think sometimes we think that maybe there's, you know, a couple of bigger countries that are helping out in their own little way. But to hear that there's 64 countries that are involved, that is incredible um, how everybody is coming together and uniting together in order to make this happen. So um, I wouldn't want you to go through and list all 64 countries, but what would you say, you know, I remember that day in, in the DFAC, you know, you know, there was Spain here and you just listed off a few. So can you tell us a little bit about some of the other countries that are involved and, and not, maybe not necessarily what they're doing, but how they're involved and how that helps out? Sure. Well, so two things. But I think before I get into that, it's important to remember why. You know, the reason that there are more than, you know, six, there are 64 countries uh, part of this is because I think people understand that that ISIL, this enemy, is a, a legitimate threat. You know, we saw them do two pretty significant terror attacks in Paris. We saw them do a very large attack in Brussels. We know they were at least the inspiration, if not somehow behind the attack in San Bernardino, California, several months ago. We also know that they've been responsible for other attacks that maybe don't make the news as much, uh, you know, in places like as far away as Indonesia and other places. In fact, we estimate uh, that they have done, I want to say it's 60 attacks around the world in the last two years and have caused more than a thousand casualties, whether injured or, or, or killed. So this is a real legitimate global threat. And so the, the nations of the globe have come together largely to, to help combat it. Um, so the 64 nations that are part of this, some of those nations uh, are only able to contribute money. They don't have the military might to project people as far away as Iraq. They don't have, so they'll contribute how they can. Sometimes they contribute weapons, they'll contribute ammunition, they'll contribute money, uh, they'll contribute medical supplies, however they can. Uh, there are a handful, actually 18 total countries, who have sent troops here to Iraq to help on the ground. Uh, most of those troops are in the training business. So I think the largest contributor, larger contributors include uh, the Australians, uh, New Zealand, uh, the Brits, of course, the French. Uh, of course, the French have suffered mightily under under ISIL. You know, they've had two terrible attacks. Uh, the Dutch, uh, the um, the Belgians. Uh, so a lot of the European nations are the ones who've really s put the Spanish that you mentioned, the Portuguese. Uh, they're really sending folks here. An interesting one is the Italians. They've sent their carabinieri. Carabinieri, we don't have anything in America exactly like a carabinieri. It's kind of a cross between uh, the FBI and uh, maybe a state trooper, kind of. So they're uniformed police. Uh, they're federal, but they're everywhere, and they're in uniform, and they'll, they do investigation. But they're, they're world-renowned, these carabinieri, uh, for how good they are at doing police things. So the carabinieri have sent hundreds of their trainers here to train the Iraqi police force to make them better. 
Uh, in fact, the Carabinieri are fun. You know, they have these great uniforms. I don't know if you noticed one. They have these great uniforms with their blue, and they've got like red piping on them, and they're some sort of special fabric. And you can't meet an Italian, can't talk uh, to a Carabinieri without him mentioning how his uniform was designed by some famous you know, Italian designer or something. So it's kind of fun. So it's great to talk to these guys. We sit down at, you know, I said the day that those bombs went off or the day that there was that bad terrorist attack in, uh, in Paris, uh, it was bombs and, and shooting. You know, I had breakfast that morning with a, with a French officer, right? That morning. And he was sitting right there and he was, you know, his family, he was of course concerned. His family luckily was not in Paris. His family was in another city. Uh, but there's certainly a camaraderie that comes from, you know, sharing these hardships and being, being here and breathing all the dust and feeling all the heat. And, and, uh, so it, it, it's good. It, it, it's really these nations coming together, sharing their tactics, their techniques. Uh, and at the end of the day, really trying to train the Iraqis to, to be able to do their jobs. It was incredible to watch, um, everybody working together. I had various points along the trip where, um, I got to speak with a French pilot and hear his excitement of learning from American troops and studying underneath, you know, the, um, the, our wonderful Air Force um, trainers. Um, getting to hear, when I was in Turkey, getting to hear from, uh, I think it might have been Spain, I think it was their Air Force, but for them to stand up and say actually publicly, thank you for letting us be a part of this and that... Um, it was. It just made the world feel a lot smaller to actually witness so many of these different countries and nationalities coming together for a common purpose. Something that we don't often get to see back here. When our news is so heavy about our troops, which is wonderful, um, we often don't get to see the bigger picture of what's really going on and how everybody's doing their best to work together to make strides in moving forward. So it's pretty impressive. Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, you know, and of course, my my daily interactions are with the press and and you know we always try to push the coalition angle uh you know we try to push you know let the press see hey this is a coalition but they're just never interested i don't know why i think they think it doesn't sell uh well i think it's uh, partly so. that coalition word i think it's used so frequently we've gotten so used to it we've kind of started to forget what it's actually about you know yeah. and and maybe as a as the united states we are so um set up to be able to lead and do well with what we have and and maybe are set up a little bit better than some of the others that we just get more news and we get more press on it. But I will say that it was very powerful from a military spouse perspective to see everybody coming together and it wasn't just us. And in some ways it was comforting to know it's that the burden isn't entirely on our troops, but that we have these other troops that are working alongside our service members and I think it, especially in my conversation with the French pilot, to hear about his family back at home, to hear about his wife and his kids, mm -hmm. and, um, and just realizing that we all have this common experience that we're going through and all of our families are kind of going through the same thing is really powerful. So, um, so you've got this awesome map that's behind you, which I think is really awesome because one of the things that you did in December that I really appreciated when you were speaking with the press and helping them get their facts straight for that day and, and things are changing every day. And so they mm. were kind of on top of just trying to listen to you and listen to what was what changes had happened since the day before. There was this point where you just pulled out a map and you just really coached them through understanding um, how complex things really are and understanding like you just described a few minutes ago about how ISIS has moved and where they're headed next and where we're trying to hold them back. and. Um, how important do you feel like it is for military families to understand something as simple as the maps of where our troops are going to and the places that they're going to? When I talked with troops there in December and asked them, what do you feel like family members don't really understand? Some of them, even there in herbal Iraq, were saying, I, I wish that my family understood that I'm really more safe than they think that I am. Just because I'm in the country of Iraq doesn't mean that I'm in extreme danger every single day, every hour of the day. Um, same thing for Afghanistan. So um, being able to just pull out a map and actually know where your service member is going, I think is extremely important and something that I don't know if military families um, just can get so busy that they don't ask about that or if it's something that our troops don't necessarily share. I know there's some OPSEC in there too. 
But um, how important is it for our, our family members to feel educated and where their service members are actually going and why? I think it's terribly important. It really is because it makes us feel uh, like there's one less thing that we have to worry about. Uh, you know, I think the more the family members understand, if nothing else, where we are and broadly speaking what we're up to, I really think that that delivers some peace of mind really on both fronts, right, on the home front and here deployed. And I think if, you know, if, if a family member kind of can visualize in their head, uh, you know, what the country looks like, if they can sort of look at a map and find Baghdad, and understand that most of our forces are concentrated in Baghdad, and they can follow the Euphrates River and the Tigris River and understand that those two rivers, that's where the bad guys are, uh, even just that. Mm -hmm. And then understand kind of the idea that we are trying to help the Iraqis push those bad guys further and further out of there, which is trying to push them, you know, west to get them out of Iraq. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it, knowing those, those kind of, big picture, um, you know, setups, I think really do help because then, you know, we don't feel like our families are clueless mm -hmm. and that we don't have to worry about it. And the mm -hmm. families, if they have even a little understanding, then I think they can kind of calm down a little bit mm -hmm. and, and, and focus on, you know, not being so nervous mm -hmm. uh, because they should be nervous, right? It, it, what, what do we all fear the most? The unknown. Mm -hmm. you know? mm -hmm. And so if we don't know what our family members facing in a foreign land, it, it creates tension mm -hmm. as it should. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so what I found is it's, it's fairly simple uh, mm -hmm. to get a baseline level of knowledge up mm -hmm. so that, you can dispel some of that fear of the unknown, if that mm -hmm. makes any sense. And, mm -hmm. you know, why not, you know, have have the kids look at the map, too? Mm -hmm. You know, hardly anybody even looks at maps anymore because it's mm -hmm. all on our phones these days, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so just going to find a map might be a challenge. But I guess you can put it up on your laptop mm -hmm. or whatever. But just, I, you know, if anybody's listening, I really encourage mm -hmm. them to get the kids, open up the map uh, on the screen, and find Baghdad. Mm -hmm. And the chances are your, your spouse is... Your, your your family member is is probably in Baghdad mm -hmm. somewhere it's a big city it's you know six million people it's like the size of New York or Chicago it's a big city uh, but your family member is probably somewhere in Baghdad and if they're not in Baghdad they're only in about two or three other places and all of those places one of them's called Al Assad one of them's called Erbil uh, and those places are, are are pretty safe right mm -hmm. now uh, we have our own security uh, that's very robust. Mm -hmm. uh, Around that, we have Iraqis who, you know, we trust, kind of provide the next layer of security. And then, frankly, it's Iraq. So outside of that, there's a lot of open space, mm -hmm. right? So we can see any enemy that's coming. So, so far, so good uh, as far as, you know, security. And we, we hope it'll stay that way. Well, I, one of the guys that I talked to, actually, in the mail room, in, or, is, do you say, is it herbal or herbal? Because I've heard it both ways. Yeah, tomato, tomato. Okay. I go with Erbil. Okay. Uh, he was in Erbil, and he was in the mail room. And he actually, when I asked him that question, he said that um, he felt safer than his wife in Baltimore. Um, <laughs> and that he really wanted people to understand. I mean, there are some missions that can be dangerous. But um, the, a lot of these troops, that was one of the overwhelming things that I got from a lot of them, was that we really are in a safer place than, than people realize. At least we're not in danger all the time. And so that was actually pretty comforting. Yeah, we're, we're not in danger all the time. You know, the big threat back when we were here before, of course, was the IED, right? Remember those, the, the roadside bombs, the improvised explosive devices? That was such, uh, that was such a threat, and we, we took so many casualties from those. And now, frankly, we don't drive on the roads anymore. We don't. We stay in our, we stay in our bases. Uh, if we have to go from one base to another, we fly. Uh, so that just that alone has That's reduced huge. the risk by orders of magnitude because we're just we're not out there. We stay, you know, we stay inside uh, for the most part. Now, some of the special ops guys may be different, but for the most part, a vast majority of us are 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 relatively safe. We're as safe as we can be. I mean, we're certainly in a foreign land. We're certainly getting combat pay. Uh, so I don't want to underplay it, 
Uh, but I don't want to overplay it either. Mm -hmm. You know, we are, you know, we've got, I mean, it's us. We're providing our own security. You know, every morning I go out and I see our guys up on the roofs. Our snipers are up there with their, you know, with their optics. We're using all, you know, the technology we have today. It, it changes so rapidly. I mean, our technology is amazing. We can see everything around us. So we're doing all the right things to keep ourselves safe. Um, I don't know if it's safer than in Baltimore. I haven't been to Baltimore in a while. Uh, <laughs> but uh, we're, we're doing okay. I guess it depends on where you're living in Baltimore. What part but, of Baltimore? Right. right. <laughs> So speaking of terminology, um, this is, I'm sure you've heard this a, a million times and you actually did a Twitter video on this. So explain why the terminology of ISIS and ISIL and some people are saying it's now IS and not ISIL anymore. So explain the changing terminology and what is it that we're calling this group now? Yeah. What are these guys called? Yeah. I like just calling them terrorists, first of all, <laughs> over the end. But so here's so their name is actually Adawa Ishmaia Iraq Washam. That's too long and too complicated. That's the Arabic name, right? <laughs> that doesn't mean anything to anybody, right? So that's that's kind of what they go by, or that's what they originally went by. And so our Dawa, I don't know what that means. Islam, you know, Islam, and you know, the Islamic State of Iraq and the Levant, Asham. Some people translate it to being the Levant. Some people translate it to mean Syria. You know, the area that we today call Syria used to be called the Levant back a couple hundred years ago. And then they changed the name of the place to Syria, but a lot of the locals still call it the Levant. So there's that. Uh, so anyway, so that's too bad. That's a mouthful. Nobody could remember that. So initially, we just kind of made an acronym out of the main letters, Islamic State. Uh, I.S. of Iraq and the Levant. I.S.I.L. Islamic State, Iraq, Levant. That was kind of how it started. But then a lot of people didn't like the Levant part, so they decided to use Syria. So then it's I.S.I.S. -S, Islamic State of Iraq and Syria. Well, then they started calling themselves the Islamic State. They just like declared we're a state. Well, nobody wanted to call them what they wanted to be called, so we kind of shied away from that. But now if you come here to Iraq or in anywhere in the Middle East, they say DASH, which apparently is the acronym for Islamia Dawa El Iraq Asham. I wrote it down because I can never remember. There it is. <laughs> <laughs> um, so so that's, the, uh, that's the Arabic acronym for what they call themselves, Daesh. So I think they all work. And, and so the press back in the States, so for whatever reason, the government kind of started on ISIL and, you know, because we're the government, we never wanted to change it after that. Uh, even though no, ISIL never really caught on outside of the U.S. government. And then the press decided to call it ISIS, ISIS. But then, of course, we're the government, so we weren't going to follow the press. We were like, no, you know, we got stubborn about it and we never wanted to change it. And then... And then when people came here, all the Iraqis were like, why don't you call them Dash like we do? It hurts my heart. I saw an Iraqi guy. He was like, yeah, my whole family cries every time you call them ISIL or ISIS, which I thought was an exaggeration. But, you know, there you go. So here, because all the locals that we talk to say Dash, we say Dash. But then if you go to Europe, which, again, 67 or 64 nations in this coalition, a lot of them European, if you go to Europe, they all use IS, Islamic State, ISIS. So it's very confusing. They all work. Uh, and like I said, I, I just call them terrorists or the enemy. That's what, I was, that's what I was going to ask you. Since you are the spokesman, what, <laughs> what do you say? So. So, actually, so I've started, so what I've started doing, I always feel like you got to speak to people in the language that they understand, right? Yeah. So when I do a press conference in the Pentagon, I say ISIL. If I'm talking to Iraqi reporters, I say Daesh. If I'm talking to Europeans, I say ISIS. If I'm talking to you, you'll hear, I bet you today, I pre, I've probably already said all three at one point yeah. today already. Yeah. So I just try to not worry about it. I figure out, I got more important things to worry about. I, I love that. I love that. So um, I know you were giving me about 45 minutes here, so I, I think I really just have a couple more questions. Um, you know, a lot of this is really educating our military families on what they need to know in order to support the troops there. Um, 
what I do you hear from the troops as far as what they need from us um, back here. I don't I don't know if that's necessarily having you repeat something you said before, but um, since I'm not able to be there and walk around and do what I did in December and say, you know, hey, what do you guys need? What is it that you need from your spouses? What is it that you need from your parents? What is it that you need from just families back at home? Um, what do you think? What do you say? What do you hear them say as far as what they need from us and how we can best support them? You know, I'll tell you the thing every soldier, I believe, fears the most. Do you want to know what we fear the most? We fear that while we're gone, you'll forget about us. Mm. You know, that is really what people, I think, fear the most. So, number one, don't forget about us. And, and of course you won't. Mm -hmm. Of course you won't. Mm -hmm. But sometimes if we haven't heard from you in a week or two, we're like, they forgot about me. So, I think that's the number one thing. That's what, you know, we have all the creature comforts we need. You sat in our in our chow hall. Yeah. We have everything yeah. we need. Um, the ice cream was great. Ice cream is really good. <laughs> the lobster was a little overcooked, I thought, but, you know, whatever. Uh, <laughs> so, you know, as far as items, I think for the most part, we have what we need to survive. What we need the most of is is, is just knowing two things. One, that you haven't forgotten about us, mm -hmm. and two, that you're okay. Mm -hmm. You know, that's what we most want to know. I want to know you're okay. Uh, and that you're not too worried about us. It, it, I kind of like it if you're a little worried about me, yeah. right? Yeah. Uh, but not too worried. Uh, so that is what we need the most. And I think one of the ways that you, you can do that, is we kind of started out talking about this, didn't we? Is, is by trying to help, trying to understand a little bit about what's going on. Mm -hmm. uh, again, you don't have to become an expert in foreign policy. Uh, mm -hmm. But I think it, taking just a little bit of time, there's some great resources online. All you got to do is, you know, Google ISIS or Dash or ISIL or any one of them, mm -hmm. uh, and you'll find some really interesting things on there, and you can kind of get, you know, spooled up on a, on what's going on here because it is very complex, and there's tribes, and there's Sunnis, and there's Shias, and there's, uh, you know, the enemy, and there's all these different things kind of coming together, and there's politics. There's U.S. politics, there's Iraqi politics, mm -hmm. there's European politics. So there, it's it's a mess. It's a jump. It's very complicated. Mm -hmm. um, you don't have to understand all of that. I don't understand all of that. None of us do. Uh, but if, if you understand the basics, right? Mm -hmm. There's there's bad guys, there's good guys, there's us, uh, there's good Iraqis, there's Iraqis that maybe aren't so good. Mm -hmm. We're trying to help the good ones fight the really bad ones, and we're, we're trying to push aside the ones that could be better, right? Mm -hmm. So I think just understanding a little bit about mm -hmm. what we're up to here mm -hmm. uh, and understanding that, you know, there isn't a single unimportant job here. There's, you know, our, our troop limit is 4,087, which is a really strange number, but that's our limit. Uh, we have additional troops that are here, TDY, so a lot of families, they'll send their loved one here for maybe just three months. A good example is the engineers. A bunch of engineers just showed up here you know, to do some construction projects for us. They're, they're uh, reservists. So they were mobilized. They get sent over here, and they're busily swinging hammers and turning wrenches and building some stuff for us. Uh, and then they're going to be gone. Uh, so, you know, at any given time, there's, there's way more than just 4,000 of us here. Uh, but so just uh, I think if you understand kind of what we're doing, understand that everyone here really is, is, is I think, well-employed. A lot of them are pulling security for, for the rest of us, uh, which I love. Mm -hmm. and my wife is very happy to hear that. Mm -hmm. A lot of guys up on the roof with sniper rifles and machine guns, and they're keeping us safe uh, while we go about our business. There's a lot of guys that are out there acting like doing drill sergeant type duty, right? They're training the Iraqis, teaching the Iraqis how to shoot, teaching the Iraqis how to move and communicate, uh, teaching them medical uh, uh, techniques, teaching them communication techniques, teaching them all the things you need to know to be an army uh, and to go out and beat this enemy. Uh, mm -hmm. And that's what we're doing. And we're doing that day in and day out. And and, and so I think if you just know that, mm -hmm. uh, you worry about us a little bit, but not too much. And and make sure you, you let us know that you haven't forgotten about us. Mm -hmm. uh, that's what we need the most. And, and uh, know this, we, none of us can wait to get home. None of us can wait to get home. You know, when I was there, it was a very brief one-week role reversal moment between my husband and I. And before I left, he said, you know, I want you to be, stay focused on the mission. He knew exactly what I needed because he had been there himself. 
He said, you know, I want you to stay focused on the mission. I want you to feel like you can fully focus on the mission and not really worry about us back at home. And he said, for that reason, I'm not going to send you these really long emails because we were in the middle of a move, a PCS, right in the middle of all this. So he was receiving household goods while I went overseas. <laughs> but it was awesome. It was great. But um, <laughs> I've but, been there. <laughs> <laughs> but he said, he said, you know, I'm not going to send you these long, lengthy emails um, so that you're not worried about me back at home. But of course, by the time I got there, you know, there, I woke up one morning and there was this great long email that updated me on everything that they were going through, how the kids were doing and how the move was going. And I found myself in that moment so glad that he chose to do that. And I realized how powerful it can be to send those emails. And, and I kind of made a mental note to myself that, you know, even if I think that I'm writing too much in an email, those updates really are powerful, especially if they are updates that don't leave the service member feeling powerless, right? Because if something were to be going wrong and my service member feels powerless to help and he can't do anything from Baghdad or Afghanistan or whatever, that's a horrible place for somebody to feel like they're in. But sending this, you know, being able to connect and say, we haven't forgotten about you, here's what's going on, and, and it's important enough to us to tell you what's going on so we feel like there's a really good connection and you feel loved, then I, I realized how powerful that actually was. I was really glad that he didn't choose to withhold all of that information. Um, and so we felt connected. And, and give me something uh, that's easy uh, and constructive to do. In other words, you know, so my wife will, she'll, she'll send me a note or, or, and anymore, it's, you can text. I mean, you get a text yeah. message here in Baghdad from back home. Crazy. But my wife will send me a text and she'll say, Hey, you know, uh, Mark, our son, he just got, he just got an A, you know, make sure you send him a note and tell him, tell him you did a good, you know, something small and easy like that, that I can do. So I feel like I'm, you know, still part of it. Uh, but you know, it's not going to distract me from what I'm here to do. You know, give me something easy to do that that's going to make a little, even if it's just a little bit of a difference. That is such, that's so nice. Cause then I just, I'm like, Oh, perfect. I can do this. So I don't have to think cause I got to think enough just trying to get through the day here. Right. So if you just hand me something that I can do easily, uh, Oh, that's such a, that's such a joy. And then I can just deliver, you know, and then I've been a good dad cause I sent, sent him a text mm -hmm. and, She's happy because, you know, I'm connected and everybody wins on something like that. So. I love that example. And I, you used the word I was going to use, which is she set you up for a win. You know, well, there was no guesswork. There was no, let's see if he sends something today. It's here is something specific that you can do where you can win, we can win, your son can win. And you don't have to think about it. You don't have to guess. You don't have to mind read. And I think that's important for marriages to be able to communicate very clearly and give each other the opportunity to win. I think that's really powerful, especially when you have to spend time apart. Would you say? It's, it's so, it's so, it's so important. And, and you know, the, the whole, you know, the marriage and the family unit, I mean, that's where our strength is, right? I mean, that is where our strength is. And whether that family is your parents uh, and brothers and sisters, or, it, you know, if, if you're married and, and have kids, that's where our strength really lies and that's one of the things that makes the american army so or american military so special so unique and so strong um because our strength comes from there and so again kind of coming full circle what the home front can do uh is is remember that you know remember that it's helping us to be strong inside of that that family unit like you said setting us up for that win inside the family unit helping us succeed inside that family unit. Uh, that's, that's where all the strength comes from. That's what you do so well. Uh, and that's, you know, what so many spouses and family members do so well, whether, again, whether it's fathers and mothers uh, or, 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 you know, spouses, it's setting us up for that win. Uh, you know, it's like in volleyball, right? The bump in the set, that's what I'm mm -hmm. counting on you guys for and get it all perfect so that I can get the spike nice and easy and woo everybody's arms up and, and happy and, that's what we all want. You don't have to send me, I mean, you send me a chocolate chip cookie, I'm going to eat it, believe me. Uh, <laughs> but much more important than that uh, is, is you, know, you know, set the ball for me and, and let me spike it over the, over the net. That's great. Um, thank you so much for, for um, sharing that and for 
really driving that home because it's a very simple thing that I think that we can do and we don't realize um, sometimes it's the little things and it's the simple things of communication and um, wanting our spouse to win that's really powerful. Um, as we close, as we close, um, there I do think that public praise of our spouse and public praise of those people who are supportive to us is really powerful. Um, it, it's a way of telling people, hey, you're doing something really well, and it's a way of saying keep doing that same thing. It's really making an impact. So if you're comfortable with it, um, I love to do these shout-outs where we give an opportunity for you to kind of maybe thank military spouses in general for something that you see that they're doing really well or what you'd like for them to keep doing. Um, and if you're, if you're comfortable with it, you brought up your wife, and if you want to just give a shout-out to your wife and something that you really appreciate that she's been doing or – the support that she offers you specifically, it's a great way, I think, to just give some public praise to her and to your relationship and how hard you guys have to work in order to be excellent at what you have to do there. So would you be okay with that? Of course. You know, I'll, I'll tell you. So here's what spouses probably don't know. Uh, and this is a shout out to all. Really, uh, single soldiers, I'm sorry, I'm going to have to leave you out on this one. because uh, So, you know, when when... When we get together, whether it's over chow or if it's just kind of in between meetings, probably the most talked about item uh, is spouses and kids. We love talking about that. Mm -hmm. And so I know, you know, the six or seven guys that I spend most of my time with here, I've heard all about all of their spouses and, and I know their names and how many kids they have. And I know which which teams and sports that their kids are on. And that's what we talk about. Again, mm -hmm. because that's what makes us strong. Uh, so there is nothing more important to us. There really is. It's what we fight for. Mm -hmm. It's what we fight for. Uh, and I certainly fight uh, for my wife, too. And she, so she's in your business. She's an LPC. Uh, and she's in your business. And I'm so proud of her. Yay! Because she just, last night, uh, she she sent me a note. Uh, and she got a new job, and she's now actually working for, although I'm a little, she's working for the Air Force, but okay, that's fine. Uh, but she got a new job working for the Air Force uh, in one of their family programs. Uh, and so I'm so proud of her, and she always keeps me updated. And, you know, she's done such a great job with our son, who's now, when I deployed here, I was taller than him, and he's now taller than me since I've been here. So he hit that growth spurt. He's 12 years old. So she has done such work with him, and his grades have stayed up, and he is just, he is succeeding in everything he does, and he's doing it because of her. And, and now she's got a new job, too, that she's very excited about, so I couldn't be more proud of her. I couldn't love her any more than I do right now. Oh, you get me all misty-eyed. I know, that's the point. <laughs> Colonel Warren, thank you so much for your time, for um, truly, truly being excellent at what you do. Was one of um, one of the biggest changes for me in December was seeing people be excellent at what they do, and also seeing the spark in their eye that said that they love what they do and that what they do feels meaningful to them and brings purpose to them. And that was something I saw in you, and that um, really was a significant experience for me because military families we often see our service members training, but we don't often get to see them in their element doing what it is they love to do. And so thank you for giving me your time, for um, caring about our family so much that you would just spend an hour talking about how we can be a better support to all of the troops everywhere, but also especially to their, um, there in Iraq. I just really appreciate you and your time and what you shared today. Um, and I just, I just really appreciate it. So thank you so much. Um, I'm looking forward to working with you more in the future. And I hope you have a really great day. I guess it's an evening for you and you get a chance to rest. So, and thank your it's wife from us here. too. Thank your wife for what uh, she does to support you so you can do what you do. Well, I sure will. And thank you, Cora, for what you've done. I mean, you have put up with a lot. That trip was not easy. I could see how exhausted <laughs> everyone was. And you are so dedicated. And you are making a difference. I want you, and I want everyone to understand that you are making a difference. So thank you for your time. Thank you for your great energy. And uh, don't ever stop doing what you're doing.